talking here today about some examples of natural selection and evolution. And many, many species of all types have evolved to have coloration, patterns that make them camouflage. And camouflage kind of need to talk about because it's just interesting. And so sometimes camouflage is a useful adaptation if um, an organism is a predator because it can sneak up on its prey. It's often useful if it's prey for a species because it can hide from a predator. But there's lots of different examples of different types of camouflage that species use. This is a flounder, it's a fish. Let's see, this is the flounder. And it blends in almost perfectly with the bottom of the, uh, the ocean that it sort of sits on. These are ibixes, deer-like creatures. There's three in this picture. There's one. There's a small one facing the camera. Here's another one. Again, the color pattern of their fur allows them to blend in perfectly in this dry, rocky environment that they live in. These are the peppered moss, and I'm going to show you a better picture in a minute. But um, you know, this is obviously the light background and the dark background. You can see the moss in there and see how the camouflage helps them. This is a catadid. It's an insect. This is its body. Okay. Obviously, it looks just like a green leaf. Even common animals, like a cat, it's camouflage. You see the cat there? Yeah. Yeah. People say they can all the time, but almost nobody really can. No. Who really can see the cat? <laughs> Actually, no. no. Is it in the water? Yeah. Yeah. These are a good picture of the peppered moss. So the peppered moss, as you know from our activity the other day, this would be the forest in which situation? Yeah, before the Industrial Revolution. This is lichen, the scaly stuff that kind of was growing on the trees. And in this condition, obviously, the light-colored peppered moth was, was much more camouflaged and was the more common variety. Every once in a while, dark ones would appear due to mutations and whatnot. But they were not very common. The light colored moth was much more common. Yep. Great. So yesterday when we um, did the that computer game. Yep. Um, usually the moths that blended in better, like got eaten more. By you? No, it was weird. Uh, I don't know. I don't they know. shouldn't have. Once the industrial revolution happened, the areas around these industrial towns the lichen died off of the trees, the trees became covered in soot, and became much, much darker. And obviously, under the darker background, after pollution had affected the trees, now the light-colored moths, it's no longer an advantage. They stick out. They're much easier for predators to find. And as we saw in that simulation, over time, the number, the percentage of light-colored peppered moths decreased as time went on, and dark ones increased. Not really, because it was not just it was not just the sun. It was also that the lichen was gone. The, the lichen that was growing on the trees died. Another really interesting example of um, natural selection is mimicry. What does it mean to mimic something? Great. Um, it's like when one species kind of like looks the same as another species. Yeah, mimicry is when a species evolves to appear to look like a different species. Why might it be a useful adaptation to look like another species? Aiden? Like if there might be like a poison like in the picture, a poisonous snake, and you could be like, you, and it has very bright colors, and then you could be like a dull brown snake, and they might, you might mimic like its bright colors, and Okay, yeah. So sometimes it's to attract prey. Other times it might be to discourage predators. It just depends on the situation. Yeah, Nathan brought up this example. 
This is the coral snake. It's um, extremely poisonous, deadly, in fact. And it has this pattern of coloration. Bright red, bright yellow, black. And often you see this in poisonous animals. Bright coloration. Why would they have bright coloration? Maybe? Maybe it's like a warning to their prey to know Yeah, it's a warning sign. Because it's not very helpful if you're poisonous and so things die after they eat you, right? Because you're already dead. What is more helpful is if you advertise the fact that you're poisonous and then maybe predators avoid eating you in the first place and then your survival rates increase. So often poisonous animals do have very bright coloration like this coral snake. Well, this is another snake. This is the scarlet king snake. It is not at all poisonous. Okay, it's harmless. However, it has evolved to mimic the coral snake. Again, just like, obviously that's an advantage because just like predators avoid the coral snake, they also will avoid eating the king snake, even though it's not actually poisonous. So that's a helpful app and adaptation that this king snake has. Does anyone know the saying that people use to remember which is which? There's a saying. Carter? Uh, yellow and uh, yellow and black fellow something like that. And red and red and yellow. Wait. Yeah, you're close. Red and yellow fellow. Uh, yellow and black jack. Yes. Red next to yellow, kill a fellow because the red and yellow and the coral snake touch each other. Red and black, you're safe, Jack, because the red and the black touch each other. So the actual pattern is not the same. There's a difference there. This is a monarch butterfly. I'm sure we're all familiar with. They become poisonous as they eat milkweed, their main source of nutrients. And so most predators, birds particularly, will avoid eating monarch butterflies. This, however, is a viceroy butterfly. It is not at all poisonous, but its pattern mimics the monarch, so it can avoid predators. This flower is an orchid. It's called the bee orchid. One of the petals of this bee orchid is actually not purple. It's brown and fuzzy and looks much like a bee. It mimics a bee. What happens is that um, other bees think that it's an actual bee and will um, attempt to mate with the flower even though it's not actually a bee. And in the process, they get pollen from the flower on them and then spread that pollen from flower to flower. More mimics. These are not snakes. What are they? Come up. Nope. They're caterpillars. Those are caterpillars that have patterns of coloration. These are not eyes. That's just pattern of its of its uh, body that mimics a snake on the other side. That's a fly that looks like a bee. This is a fly, yes. This is a hoverfly. It mimics a bee. It has this coloration pattern, but they're not actually um, That's a uh, butterfly that looks like a Yeah, this is not a spider. It's a moth. You can see its wings are white on the margins. And this brown, those are not legs, those are just pigment in the wings of this moth. Okay, so obviously that scares away predators. What's it look like? Yes, that mimics a non living substance. Bird poop. Bird poop. Oh, yeah. The swallowtail caterpillar. It mimics bird poop to help it blend in. Many, many organisms have evolved to mimic leaves. Here you see this insect grasping onto the branch. This is its body hanging down. It's the exact shape and color and size of these leaves. So obviously blends in very well. More insects. This is the body of this insect. These are its uh, appendages. They're just like leaves. Another one. That's huge. That's actually kind of scary. It's just a, a pattern of coloration pigments. 
It's Canada. It looks like a leaf that's walking through the forest. Okay? Some, how many um, aquatic animals mimic things in the water? Things like this fish. So is it the front of it? That's a tail fin. Um, yeah, it mimics a leaf. Or seaweed. Frog that mimics sort of dead leaves in the forest floor. Another fish mimics seaweed growing out of the ground. So many species have these adaptations that uh, allow them to blend in. All right, so our last couple things here. We've talked about survival of the fittest. Okay? And in natural selection, the most fit organisms are the ones that survive. What do we mean by fit? Right? The ones that uh, adapted to the environment. Yeah, the ones that have the best characteristics for whatever environment they have. And we can think about this in a few different ways. Okay? First of all, if we look at these mice, it gives you some information about different types of mice. Their fur color, how long they lived, how many babies are born, their running speed. So what do you think? Which of these mice were the most successful in terms of evolution and natural selection? Dean? The tan. The tan? How come? Uh, they lived the longest out of any of the mice, and they mm -hmm. had the most babies out of them. OK. Yeah, they might have been the slowest. No, they were second slowest. Oh, second slowest. But did they live longer? Yeah. Yes. And probably more importantly, they were able to reproduce the most, giving the most offspring and passing on those genes to their offspring. We could go a step further, though. Look at these lions. George, Lucky, Spock, Slip. In this example, which would you say is the fittest of the lions? Which was the most successful in an evolutionary sense? Grace, what do you think? Um, well, like. Can you give me a reason. Slick. Okay. Because he, he gave, like, help father the most cubs. Well, no, not help father the most, but, like, survive mm -hmm. to the most. Okay. What else? Grady, what were you going to say? Um, slick, because even though know, he uh, didn't live longest, and even though know, Lucky had more uh, cubs than him, uh, he only had 14 out of 25, he had 19 out of 20. Yeah. Yeah, so we can't just think about, okay, well, how long did they live, right? Because, yeah, Lucky lived the longest, 16 years. Also had the most cubs that were fathered, okay? It was the smallest of the lions. But, like Grady was just saying, Grace, Slick, maybe only lived for 10 years, but had 20 cubs, and probably most importantly, 19 out of those 20 cubs were able to survive into adulthood. So most likely, Slick had the adaptations, the characteristics that not only allowed it to reproduce, but to pass on to its offspring these traits that allowed them to then survive into adulthood. And so that is um, probably a good definition of fitness as well. The ability to survive and also produce offspring that can survive talk more about the um, giraffes tomorrow. Are there any questions about anything in our notes related to evolution and natural selection? Um, let me show you a video here about another example of evolution. That's kind of interesting, I think. <laughs> 